Welcome to Gardener's World. I know I've often said how important it is just to stop and take in the garden, but that's never been more true than now because the blossom, which is better than I've ever known it in my life, is beginning to stream off the trees and the petals are covering the ground like confetti. And I know that in a day or two, it'll all be gone. But just for this moment, with the sun shining, the trees still billowing with flower, and all this new green energy coming through, this is the moment to stop and give thanks. And also to be aware of the fact that all this blossom means we're going to have a bumper crop of apples later in the year. On tonight's programme, Adam returns to Leicestershire to help Amit and Babuti move on to the next stage of designing their garden from scratch. Boys and their toys, eh? I do love the digger. Here we go. Carol is celebrating the delicate seasonal beauty of erythroniums, the dog's tooth violet. That poise and elegance puts them head and shoulders over so many other flowers. And I've got work to do in the vegetable garden, but first I'm going to be adding height and colour to the cottage garden. I love the way that the forget-me-nots create this froth of blue running around the whole of the cottage garden. But they are very low. And what is always good to get in any ball of any kind is a mid-story. If you can get it with colour, so much the better. Now here I've deliberately tried to cultivate a jumble of soft colours. And I'm adding to that with three separate plants, each of which is a spike or a spire of colour. The first is a babascum. This is babascum jackie, and you can see it's got this pinky colour. Just touch with lilac and peach. Babascums tend to do best in quite poor soil. They like free draining, stony, chalky, or sandy conditions, but they don't last very long. Some of them are sort of short lived perennials. They don't last more than two or three years, but then they will seed themselves and they find the places where they want to grow. Whatever happens, you do not need to beef up the planting hole with compost of any kind. So just make a hole and pop it in. There's quite a lot of moisture in the soil, so I'm not worried about watering it in, but any doubt at all will do no harm by giving it a really good soak. And that's the height. But I think in this space here, I could get a hollyhock. Now, I love hollyhocks. This one is called Halo Apricot, and hollyhocks are biennials. And what that means is that it sets its seed in the first season, the end of summer, germinates, plant grows, establishes the body, so it looks something like this in spring, and then we'll do its flowering that summer, which means either you sow fresh seed every year for flowering the following summer, or they seed themselves if they like it. The problem I get here with hollyhocks is rust, and they are rather prone to it. Rust will manifest itself on hollyhocks as these sort of orange pustules you see on the foliage. The plant will begin to defoliate and fade. The best defense is good drainage, good airflow, and plenty of sunshine. I've got one more plant which I want to put in. It's not going to fit in this space. I'm going to move to the other bit. I've got delphinium to plant in here. Now you think of delphinium as being one of the archetypal blue plants, but actually they come in a range of colors. And this one is Magic Fountains Lavender. This slightly mauvey lavender color to it. I've got three plants, and if I dot them through the border, I think that could be very effective. Now these are true herbaceous perennials, so they will last quite a long time, and therefore get bigger as they grow. The thing about a delphinium is it is one of those plants that defines a tower of flower. And they are very easy to grow, except for one little problem, which is early on in spring, sort of early March, when you get the new shoots, slugs love them. But if you pass that stage and see them through till April, there's not a lot you need to do. 
like putting tall plants near the front of a border. You don't want them all at the back. You want to be able to look through flowers as well as up to them. Unlike the verbascum, this is a plant that will thank you for having good organically fortified soil with good drainage but also plenty of feed. So this can go in here. Now what you will have to do if you plant delphiniums is support them. These are a tall plant and they need a stake or maybe some hoops, something that will stop right back to the ground. That gives it a break and then it will regrow and flower again in August and September. Now that's three classic cottage garden plants added to the borders of height and colour and they'll join all the others I've got here and one of my favourites is Polymonium. Jacob's Ladder is just beginning to produce flowers now and last summer we went to County Durham to visit a national collection of Polymonium. I got the first polymonium over 25 years ago and when I bought it, it was supposed to be a blue flowered plant. When I got it home, it was white. So this was kind of, oh, right, okay. So I'll try and get a blue one then. And it took me another few goes before I actually managed to get a blue one. And then I found out there were 70 others of them. So I thought, okay, so I'll, I'll just get a few more than shall I? Yeah. I was a member of Plant Heritage, and I'd been a member for quite a few years, and I found there was no national collection of polymoniums, and at that point I seemed to have quite a few, and I'd done a bit of research and found they were all wrongly named garden centres, so I felt it was my duty to try and get them all correctly named, because there were some really good plants out there. And a lot of people went, oh, polymoniums, yes, I've got that. It's a bit of a weed. And then you sort of tell everybody that actually, you know, there are some really nice plants. So it's really nice to be able to tell people about those. The flowers on polymoniums are really quite pretty and have a lovely scent as well. They make quite good cut flowers. They come mostly in blues and whites, but there's also pink forms, yellow forms, and in lots of different sizes and shapes as well. Some of them are quite trumpet form and they can be in flower right throughout the summer. Polymoniums are really easy to grow. They don't require any particularly special conditions. They'll grow in most soils, apart from really, really dry soils. And although they'll grow in part shade, some of the taller species will certainly do quite well in full sun, as long as they have a, a moist soil, which if you've got a dry soil, you just need to put a bit of organic matter in to improve it. This is my favorite polymonium, Polymonium foliosissimum. Foliosissimum means very leafy. So it has a lot more leaflets right the way up the stem, so it makes a much bushier plant. And it has the same sort of purple flowers, but with a nice central purple ring. And it's producing flowers, which it's produced for a couple of weeks, and it'll go on producing flowers for a lot longer right through the summer. Although there are 70 polymoniums in the whole collection, only three of them actually set seed prolifically, which is the Polymonium ceruleum, the native British wildflower, tubular flowered one, which you'll seed around everywhere, and Polymonium boreal, which you see in garden centres still to this day under 20 different names. On a wet afternoon like this, I often come over to the potting shed and do some propagating of the plants, especially now when the seed heads are forming. So I've got some seed heads here of Polymonium ceruleum dissectum, which is a nice cutly form of ceruleum. You can either leave these in a plastic bag and they'll just drop into it, or if you're impatient like me, you can just give them a bit of a squeeze and then they'll drop into a tray and you can get them ready to sow. So the coir block, I mix that up by just dropping that into about six litres of water and that expands up to make a full bit. And here's some I've done earlier. So this is a mixture of organic peat-free bark compost with the coir. And then what I'll be doing is putting that into the seed tray. And then once I've filled the seed tray, just press it down with a presser board, give it a bit of a tap to settle it. And then you've got a nice surface to work to. I can then just get the seeds that I've got from the seed heads here and just scatter them over the surface so that they'll germinate even and just sieve a bit of compost over the top of them just to cover them lightly. If you haven't got professional 
equipment to germinate them in. You can just put them with a piece of glass or a cover over them and then they'll come up in about 14 days and you can prick them out and they'll end up being like that. I think polymoniums are great. I love the fact that they're actually an edible flower as well because I love to grow edible flowers and I love things you can eat. So it's really nice that you can have something where you can actually take them off and put them in salads. The other good thing is that we grow all the plants organically and they're really good at attracting insects. You get all the hoverflies and bees. So you can watch the insects on them all the time. So it's really good that they're great for encouraging wildlife into the garden. Polymonians are one of those plants that are unlikely to be a star. They're a supporting actor. But they're so important with this blend and mixture of lovely plants like that that makes a garden sing. Now, I've been constantly tinkering with this area, and unashamedly so, because I think these things take time to find their shape. There were box balls here, and we've got herbs on one side, and I've planted these yews, which I love. These are Irish vestigia yews. They give height, and that's really good. Now, underneath... I've planted box and yew, and all these plants have been taken from cuttings. However, these yew, to form a solid ball, will take about 10 years before they reach the kind of proportions that I'm looking for. And the truth is, I'm not quite as young as I used to be, and I'm a little bit more of a hurry and aware of the passing of time. So I've made a decision. I'm going to lift the yew in this area, and transplant it to the grass borders, and I'm going to go shopping and buy myself some topiary yew balls, which I'll put in there, and that will work with a box. Now, this is a good time to be moving or planting evergreens, whereas if you're doing it with deciduous plants, better to wait till the dormant season. transplant them. The plan is to have U balls on either side of each of the entrances into the grass border. Now, I've cleared some of the plants there. The first thing I need to do is to dig it over. Always before any planting like this, double check there are no weeds in there that are going to cause a problem. And I'm thinking particularly of things like nettles, cooch grass, bindweed, ground elder, anything that could get in amongst the roots of the yew needs to be really carefully taken out. The one thing about you is it just hates sitting in heavy wet soil. So if you've got clay, you will have to add grit. If I put one there, and another one there, that, and another one there like that, immediately I start to get a bit of volume. And because they're all going in at an angle, the new growth wants to grow vertically. And that will give a much denser, more solid ball, which then will clip better. I'm taking care not to plant them too deeply, but at the same level they were in before. Although you cast a heavy shade, as light as possible, because it will grow much more densely. Okay, that's planted. Next thing is, just because a plant needs good drainage, it doesn't mean to say it doesn't like water. Yews need watering. And if your soil is a bit thin, a feed of nettles or comfrey will help it out. By and large, they'll be fine, but don't let them dry out too much. 
that Adam Frost has returned to Leicester to help out our couple who are making a brand new garden in a brand new bill. And it turned out that the weather wasn't that kind to them. Nevertheless, they got stuck in. I'm back at Emmett and Vabucci's house and I can't wait to see how they're getting on constructing the garden. When I first got here, the garden aspect was long at the back of the house, but with an imposing wall at the end of the garden that they really didn't like. My design tries to refocus the garden, using trees and climbers to hide the back wall and two terraces to create a new focal pool for the space. I left them digging out those terraces, not exactly an easy task. So how have they done? Well, been busy. Yeah. You've done well, mate. You've done well. Cheers, thank you very much. Yeah. Do you know what? I already feel this feels quite cold, cold here, yeah. and I bet if we move over... Yeah, yeah, it feels warmer, doesn't it? Yeah. Need my shades. You do need the shades, <laughs> you do. We're stood exactly on that terrace. Straight away, that angle gives you that sense of movement. You know, there's a bigger sky and you don't feel quite so imposed. Yeah. You know, you're It feels worrying. a lot more private. Yeah? Yeah. Exactly. There was one point where we thought we could just level that off and possibly integrate um, a sleeper against there. So, we can so, have our... so in a sense, what you're saying is, is where the garage is there. Yes. It's just to, to put a little wall in there. Yeah. Yeah. Put a little water butt in yeah. that corner. Brilliant. Come on, let's get off. <laughs> now it's time to tackle the first of the two terraces, and lucky for us, Amit's friend Manu has come to help us right, with the heavy lifting. Good. So I think first thing we need to do, get the rest of this paving up. I think if we clean it up, we can reuse it. It'll save us a few quick. Let's crack on. Let's... We've got a lot to do today. Yeah. Keep brushing. There you go. They need a wash. They need a wash. Just give yourself another job. <laughs> so it might seem a little bit strange to people asking why we're lifting the paving. I want to change that angle. And I think by changing the direction of the paving will really draw you out into this space. Having taken up the paving, it's time to have a look at the lay of the land. The guys have pulled everything out, but I just need to whip out anymore, or we've got to adjust our hardcore ready for our paving. If you can, lay your paving about 150 millimetres, that's six inches, below your damp proof course. Hammer in a series of pegs at the same depth, using a spirit level to check your levels. As you can see, the pegs have gone in. That peg will be the finished level of the paving, which straight away says to us we've got to pull some more of this out because we're going to need at least 50 mil for our paving and we're going to need 50 mil for our, our bed, which is our sand cement mix that's going to go under our paving. So remember the top of your pegs indicate the finished paving level, but beneath this you'll be adding hardcore and a mortar bed to lay your paving on. So you need to dig out enough to allow for both. We need to take out a bit more soil and luckily Amit's got just the thing. Boys and their toys, eh? I do love a digger. Here we go, we're off. Right, mate. Just run off the top of that peg and just see roughly what we are down to the hard top. About 100 mil. Yeah, brilliant. Mil. And all we got to do now is drag that out. That's fantastic. Okay. okay. Brilliant. So what we're doing is really using the machine to just to take the work out of this, really. If you haven't got a machine, it's a fair amount of digging. But we're just dragging that level all the way back and then we're going to compact this surface and that will give us something really firm to lay our paving, ultimately, and then it won't move. As you can see, it's turned out lovely. So I'm now soaking wet, but we need to get the levels in here. So at the moment, I've got my level peg that runs all the way across. To make sure the rainwater runs away from the house, the paving needs to be laid on a slight slope. I'm using pegs and a line to mark out that gradient. Once I've done that, I now know that I have to dig out a little bit more at the lower end of the terrace to allow for the base. So now we know from the house to the end of the terrace, we're going to have a fall of 50 mil. So the water won't sit anywhere near the house. It'll all run away. This area will become one or two terraces, where Vibuti and Amit can entertain friends and family. And later on, they could look at building in some seating to really make it cosy. But that is some way off. Today, the rain has stopped play, well, at least for the paving anyway. And what Booty has sensibly gone back indoors. Muppet here is going to get on with another job. 
as you can see, the weather has not improved. But in the meantime, what I can get on with is wiring these fences. What we're going to do all the way along here is wire them to grow climbers up. First one was set about 18 inches, and then we're just going to work up. I put the next one about every metre is what I do put an eye on it. And the reason all the wire's out, using galvanised wire, thread it through the eyes, twist it tightly at one end, then pull it really taut and tie at the other end. And then the final little bit can just tighten that up and that nice and tight. It's time to repair for the retaining wall, which will be made from the sleepers that Amit has reclaimed. So what these will be, ultimately, they'll be the supports for your sleepers, right? Mm -hmm. So that's 570, holes dug, and then just move that over. It's a good idea to set posts into the ground. Your sleepers will be attached to these four supports. Then concrete the posts into the ground. Today we're using a dry mix, and this rain will add any water we need to help set this concrete. But ideally, this is a job for a much drier day. Do you know, if we can at least get this into the field today, mm -hmm. then next time we can come, we can lay the paving, can't we? We can get the yeah, paving down, um, and also we can maybe start to put that little bit of brick detail through. And I'm sure between now and next time we come, it'll stop raining. Fingers crossed. Cheers. Thank you very much. I have to say that did look as though everybody got very wet indeed. We've all had days like that. But it will be worth it. And with Adam's advice, you know it is going to look fantastic when it's done. What I'm doing here is transplanting tete -tet daffodils that I've been growing in these very handsome pots into the ground. Because I want them to die right back. And that will take another four to eight weeks, depending where I put them. Which means I can't use the pot in that time. So if I put them in the ground and leave them to die back there, I've immediately freed up some nice pots that I can use, and I can either dig the bulbs up and replant them in pots in autumn, or I can leave them in the ground as a row of cut flowers. Either way, I win. What really matters is that whether you put them in the ground or leave them in the pot, do not trim back the foliage at all. Just let them die back naturally, because as they do so, the goodness goes down into the bulb, and that will improve the quality of next year's flower. Now these tete -tet daffodils really do best in full sun. But Carol celebrates a plant that is elegant and delicate and one of the glories of spring, but is happiest in the shade of woodland. The lilting flowers of erythroniums one of the true delights of spring, with their bronze and pale green, their poise and elegance put some head and shoulders over so many other flowers. They what you call a true Cinderella plant. They have to do everything before the clock strikes twelve, push up through the ground, flower set seed, and then go to sleep again while the canopy overhead fills in and they rest until the next spring. Erythroniums are from all sorts of different locations in the northern hemisphere. A few are from Japan, one is from Eurasia, but the great majority come from North America, both the western and the eastern seaboards. But wherever they're from, they all love the same sort of conditions. Forest glades, the edge of woodland, that's why they've evolved and that's where they thrive. This little tell is quite magical actually. There's several different hybrids, but the one that's most outstanding is this one, Erythronium Hidcut Pink. It's a true delight. It's robust, it's strong, and yet at the same time it retains this glorious deportment. It's one of the last to flower, and in addition to all its other qualities, including its marble leaves, is the fact that it's scented.
this delightful Erythronium oregonum. As you'd expect, it's from Oregon, on the western seaboard of the United States. And when you look at it, these marvellous leaves, heavily marbled in bronze, give you a clue to why it's called trout lily, or fawn lily, as in a baby deer. And then up these flower stems, uh, first of all, buds tightly hold together, and as they extend and open, they reflex. So the inner workings of the flower are protected by them. At the same time, these bright yellow splodges in the centre of the flower are exposed. They're pollen guides. They bring in those insects and say, this way, lots of pollen and nectar in here. And as the insect enters the flower, searching for that nectar, the stigma protrudes, so any pollen it happens to be carrying is dusted onto that stigma. And when it's off, it flies to another plant and cross-pollination happens. And that's how come you see these colonies of little seedlings clustered around the parent plants. So here's a lovely example of a big colony. This is Erythronium revolutum. And you can see that as these tepals start to fade, seed heads are formed here. Eventually these green fleshy seed pods will become brown and desiccated. On a windy day, they'll be blown around all over the place, creating this lovely effect. If you look here, you can see this tapestry of seedling leaves right the way over. And eventually those will make bulbs and each year the bulbs will swell and swell and push themselves down. If we have a look at this one, and this is Californica, and on the end of each of these is a brand new bulb with these roots at the side and also at the base, and these are contractile roots, so they will pull the bulb down gradually to the correct sort of depth so it can gather the most nutrients from the soil. The generic name for erythroniums is dog's tooth violets. Nothing to vague resemblance between this bulb and a canine tooth. Hence the name. These can be potted up singly now, and next year they can be planted out. Erythronium californicum is a widespread species, and it's given rise to all sorts of beautiful cultivars but this is probably called white beauty it has very distinctive red markings on its petals pollen guides again to bring insects into the flower sadly it's sterile so it doesn't set any seed but you can easily increase it by digging down in the winter after it's formed a nice big clump dividing up the bulbs and replanting them you might not have a great oak wood to plant them under but providing you've got a shrub or two or a small tree they love that kind of dapply shade. When you're planting them, search down amongst the roots until you find nice deep pockets of soil. But don't feed them, just add lots of leaf mould or good compost, and you should end up with a wonderful carpet of these glorious spring flowers. Erythroniums bring a simple elegance to the springtime scene. Despite their understated demeanour, they, and personally, I find them irresistible. There's no doubt about it, the erythroniums have a particular charm. And they have been very late this year, as so many plants have, which means that they've lasted much longer than they normally do. It's lovely to see them still. But a plant that hasn't suffered from our cold winter or spring is this vine. Of course, the protection of the greenhouse has ensured that. The roots are outside in rich soil, the result being that it is romped away. I pruned it really hard in February, so all this new growth, and the one thing I have learned from growing dessert grapes indoors that quality and quantity are incompatible and the secret is is just prune and prune hard and keep on top of them 
<laughs> and already some of it escaping out through the roof and through the glass. And if I didn't prune them, they'd completely take over. So I can ruthlessly cut back above this bar. And then what I want to make sure is that for each of these canes coming up from the main stem going across, that I only have three side shoots that are bearing fruit, and each side shoot has a maximum of two bunches. So we've got a bunch there and a bunch there, so that's two. So we can take this off. We've got a bunch there, we can leave that. So I'm going to take that off. So we work our way up here, and it's just a question of being systematic. Don't worry too much about taking off too little or in too much at this stage. But what you do want to do is start to identify the bunches you want to keep and harvest come September, October time. And if you get it right, if you put the energy into just a few bunches, a variety like this, this is Black Hamburg, can be absolutely... Still to come, we've got the penultimate finalist in our Every Space Counts competition. But first, Joe goes down to call to meet a truly inspirational young gardener. Welcome to Trelissic. At the heart of this vast 375 acre estate is a beautiful woodland garden featuring all year round interest and colour. The grounds also offer breathtaking panoramic views which reach far and wide over the stunning River Fowl. I've come to meet one of Trelissic volunteers whose perspective on life has been changed by the power of ordinary volunteer. Despite having cerebral palsy, limited mobility and hearing, he's been a volunteer here at Trelissic for over six years and he's never let his condition hold him back. So Oliver, why did you first get involved as being a volunteer here? I love, I love it here. I was taught the lovely plant and the by the lovely greenery and that really made me realise that gardening could be, could be something I could get involved with. So what are your roles and responsibilities here? What, 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 what do you do on a day-to-day -day basis here? I do a bit of raking, a bit of pruning, and get heading. Yeah, I do pretty much everything, really. I feel that it, um, the ability doesn't really hold you back. And you, you can do pretty much anything, really, if you want. Am I right in thinking that the garden spurred you on to get involved in other creative activities? I do portrait, music icon portrait. That could give me Hendrick, David Bowie. Because you also, you're, you play music, you play the guitar and sing. I do. <laughs> and you busk, is that right? I do. And I love inspiring other people, gig I think that's great. Yeah. What would you say to anybody, you know, other people with disabilities who are thinking of, you know, gardening or becoming a volunteer? It has changed my life. I feel happier when I'm outside. I feel a lot more happier. I think it makes me feel good about myself. If you're a gig go for it. They yeah. go always the gardening job out out there for them. The gay leaves are looking lovely. They're <laughs> uh, back in the white colours. Yeah, yeah, they say the scent is really good. Yeah, it's fabulous. The gay lovely. Some lovely people here, aren't they? They are. They're good. Uh, they rain from different colours. Yeah. Different dye, different colours. They've got lovely contrast, yeah, colourful yeah, contrast yeah. as well. Go. I think they're very ugly if people with a Yeah, they are pushing quite out into the path along here, aren't they? And I think that caused many problems for the uh, for the business here. I think. Yeah. Will you give it a bit of a trim then? Yeah, go on then. You, you get in there. You get in down the bottom and I'll get in up the top. We have to prune before the bud and not after. Because yeah. if you prune after the bud, <laughs> the growth won't come through. Absolutely, yeah. I'm always looking for an outward facing bud as well, because anything that's growing in, if you prune back to that, it just gets more and more dense in the middle. As well as the, the physical aspect of gardening, you like this. If, you, if you've got something on your mind that's bothering you or you've, 
you're, you're going through a lot of problems. I think it helped a lot. Yeah, connecting with nature. And yeah, nature, well, nature very calm and peaceful. Yeah, and healing. It has healing qualities, yeah. just, just yeah, gardening. Yeah. Oh, I think you can click one behind the guy. Yeah? Oh, that one? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's it, Oliver. Yeah. yeah, looking good, job done. Yeah. Bit of teamwork, you see, makes all the difference. It does, absolutely. <laughs> wow, what a beautiful spot. This is absolutely gorgeous, isn't it? It is. The view over the river Fowl, the light is just wonderful. So, is this one of your favourite spots? It is. And at the end of the day, I like to sit here and just enjoy it. I have to say, you're an inspiration, everything that you do, your okay. gardening, your painting, your music, and yeah, just keep you. it up. Lovely to meet you. Thank you. Thanks, Oliver. It's good to see how gardening is not just therapy, which most of us know, but it's also empowering and enabling and opens doors that perhaps you didn't even know were there. I'm hoeing my garlic, which I planted last September, and it's grown really well. We've had a pretty tricky winter and spring, but the garlic hasn't minded at all. Elephant garlic down one end, and two different types of garlic, hard neck and soft neck here. And the key to garlic at this time of year is to keep them weeded, and a hoe is by far the best way to do that, being careful not to chop them off. It's an easy mistake to make to think that because we associate garlic with the Mediterranean and the hot summer days, that it doesn't need water. It likes heat, but it also likes rich soil and moisture. So if it gets very dry, give it a really good soak at least once a fortnight if there's been no rain. And that's why you weed it, because you don't want them to compete for moisture and nutrients. And then when it starts to die back, which will be sometime round about June, early July, then you cut the water out, all the goodness goes into the bulb, and then they're ready for hot. seem at this time of the year as though the vegetable garden is lagging behind the flower garden. There's an awful lot of bare soil and things are happening slowly but don't be fooled because it is all going to, to keep on top of things, keep weeding and also making sure your supports are in. And my peas have germinated. I've got a lovely bundle of fresh pea sticks which are part of the coppice process. This is the side shoots and all the twiggy stuff that isn't used for bean sticks and they make perfect support for peas. Peas twine rather than climb, and they've got tendrils. So netting will do the job. Any kind of twiggy prunings are perfect. And I always wait until the seeds germinate and you get the shoots appearing so you don't stick on top of them. And then just go along the edge so that the twigs overlap. And you do this on both sides. And what you end up with is the ideal support that you don't have to worry about. They will find that and climb up and then the peas hang off and they're easy to pick. Have quite radically different height and vigour. So it is worth checking to see how high the ultimate growth will be and then monitoring your support accordingly. I confess that I have definitely sewn these rows too close together because now that pea sticks are in, it's a real squidge to get to them. It doesn't matter too much because they're very short and you can get most of the peas from the end. But really, you want to leave enough room so you can walk comfortably down between the rows and pick your peas so every other row would have been better. But I'm trying to get in as many different varieties as I can to the space I've got so I can share the results with you. But however you plant them, what I then do is just trim off all the bits that are sticking out sideways, like that, so you don't get scratched, and this big one here. And then I use these along the bottom. So just stick them in like that, and that adds a low level of support just for those early tendrils. So nothing is wasted. 
And finally, if in about a week's time there's clearly some peas that haven't germinated, just pop some more in and the soil will have warmed up and they will quickly catch up the others. And if you haven't sown any peas yet at all, don't worry, it's not too late. It is something you want to get on with and do this weekend if you can. We're going to buy a packet of peas, stick them in a nice rich piece of ground and you should have those delicious fresh peas in about eight to ten weeks time. Right, I'll finish those later because now I want to plant another legume which I've never grown before. Just over a month ago, I sowed some edamame seeds. Now that's a fancy name. They're growing, they're healthy, they're quite easy to grow if it's not cold. They absolutely are not hardy, so a touch of frost will kill them. So if you've grown them and you're planting them out, just be confident there's no more frost to come. And in fact, what I'm going to do is plant some out now, hold some back for another couple of weeks, and then plant those out as a kind of insurance net. Now I sowed these in loo rolls. They grow very well, so I'm going to plant the whole roll with the plant inside it rather than trying to unwrap it. They're going in this legume bed. I'll tell you what, it's getting hot. Okay, roll that. You grow them in rows or a grid, no closer than six inches together, and actually about nine inches is probably better. Give them room to bush out and grow. And of course, the cardboard will biodegrade into the soil. Just plant that in like that. If you're thinking of growing these, it's probably a good idea to grow them under cover to get them going quickly. But you could put the seeds straight in the ground. Keep them in their final placings, so six to nine inches apart. And if the soil is warm enough, they will germinate and grow. And because they're going to be eaten green, you could sow them any time up till the middle of June, the end of June, and you'll get a crop in a couple of weeks' time, just in case we have a, a touch of frost. Although I will have some cloches on standby, so if I get a frost warning, I can fleece them or cloche them, and that will help. Right, I'll water those in. Right, with a fair wind, I should be harvesting my first edamame around about mid-July. Now, we are looking for gardens that are beautiful, gardens that are innovative, creative, and tiny. This is part of our Every Space Counts competition. We've had lots of applications, and they've been whittled down to a short list of five. We've shown three, but this week, it's time to see number four. My name's Caroline. I live in East London. I moved here 21 years ago when the house was a new build house. The garden was just a small paved area and some sort of rubbishy builder's soil. My mum came to stay, who thankfully for me is a fantastic gardener. She took one look at it and said, don't even think about a lawn, it would never grow. The design for the garden just started with finding a circular patio. And from there, to sort of try and introduce some, gradually introducing different pots and things which help to spread the colour out around the garden and provide more interest. The inspiration for my garden comes from all the gardens that I visit, really. Big flower shows such as Chelsea, Hampton Court, and you can go and really be inspired, see something you like and think, oh yeah, I'll have a go at that and buy another pot. <laughs> the plants I have in the garden they're not really my favourites, they've become my favourites, but it's more a case of what I found that like the conditions that I've got. Things like the clematis, they love the conditions, they're cool roots, they just head for the sky and I love them. I've not been that successful at growing things from seed, I really don't get enough sustained light into the garden, but I have a lot more success through cultivating by division and that can be all sorts of plants. Things like London Pride, the Ajugas, the Hostas. One of the things I have, though, grown from a seed is that after going for a walk a few years ago, I picked up some conkers, and I've now got two horse chestnut trees in the garden, so I don't quite know what I'm going to do with those. The challenges I have with this garden, it's a, it's a plus 
and a minus really. It's very sheltered, which means it it's, has a lovely climate. But that also means a lot of bugs and pests can survive. Slugs, snails, vine weevils. In the early days, things were just shredded. But I've tried various things and without a doubt, nematodes are the most successful and the best thing to use. A couple of special plants are things like the red camellia mum gave to me all those years ago so she couldn't get it to grow. She said, here you go, you have a go with it. And the squiggle hazel was one of the first ones I bought as well. They're, they've both been with me over 20 years now and I've got a bit of a soft spot for both of those. The garden's special to me because it started literally as nothing. I've nurtured it and it's become just my little haven. We'll be showing you the final garden in our shortlist on our next programme, and then you'll get a chance to vote which one of the five you think should be the winner, which we will announce at Gardeners World Live. The garden is full of joys at the moment, but one of the flowers that is giving me particular pleasure are the camassias. And this is Camassia cusicii, which I planted last September to add colour, to just stretch out the flowering season, because we have lots of crocus and fritillaries and daffodils, and then it's all just grass. So I'm trying to pull colour through. And what I love about this particular Camassia is the relationship between the open, delicate blue and these bright spots of yellow. It's absolutely watcher beds and also by the pond, and they're all doing very well. You coming? You staying? seedlings. Clarkia purpurea burgundy wine for the jewel garden. Deep, rich flowers with this slightly glaucous feathery foliage. Now they're in the plugs here and they're a little small to plant out. They will grow, they'll grow fine, but they'll be lost amongst the competition. One of the problems that we have here at Long Meadow is our soil is so fertile that anything that will grow strongly grows extra strongly which means that anything else that's a little bit tentative or more temperature dependent can get swamped, particularly at this time of year. May, June, when the nights are cold, some things are a little bit slow to get going and they get buried and you can lose plants that way. So I'm going to put these on and keep them in the pots for another month, perhaps. And I'm putting it into a potting compost as opposed to a seed compost. So there's plenty of nutrition in this. A good tip is to include into your compost mix, even if you just add it to a bag of ball compost and nothing else, is a little bit of the soil of your garden. Sieve in, no more than say, a shovel load of soil, because that contains the bacteria and the fungi and all the microorganisms that the plant is gonna start a relationship with. That's enough to enable it to grow away when you transplant it much better and quicker. The plants are much healthier and make that transition. Whereas very often, if you have to, particularly if it's a little bit cold, it sits there. It takes a week, sometimes two weeks, before it starts to grow its roots out into the soil because it's a shock to the system. And it's that period before it starts to grow strongly that it's most vulnerable to attack from pests such as slugs and snails. But if it grows away quickly, you have a much healthier plant. I've got another tray after this to do, it'll take a little while, but that's fine. But maybe you're not planning to do any potting on this weekend, but nevertheless, here are some other jobs you can be doing. It's a good idea to cut back some of your dahlias. Take off the top growth down to the first pair of strong leaves, and this will stimulate regrowth of side shoots, which in turn will carry more flowers for longer, albeit they'll start to flower a little later in the season. If you have a pond of any dead material or old leaves, but don't discard them straight away, put them on the edge of the pond so any dragonfly larva, frogs or newts can crawl back into the water. Leave it for a couple of days and then take it to the compost heap. Lily beetles have become an increasing problem on all members of the lily and fritillary families. 
but they are bright red, so easy to see. Approach them carefully because if they hear the vibrations of your footsteps, they fall off the plant and lie on their backs on the ground. And as their undersides are brown, they're almost impossible to see. Take them off the plant and then dispatch them as you feel fit. I'm cutting some flowers for Nigel because yesterday was his birthday. Not any old birthday either. It was his 10th birthday. Nigel, here, look. I've got some flowers. Would you like some tulips? Would you like a ball? Rejecting both tulips and ball because he knows in my pocket is a biscuit. Would you like that? You would. That's it. We've had quite a lot of those today, really. The birthday party has rolled on for a couple of days. There you are. That's enough. Enough. I'll keep the flowers for myself. This is a tulip called Dance Lion. And I love the way that it's so full. It's almost like a peony. But like most tulips in the garden, it is nearly over. It's practically done its thing. And normally with cut flowers, you cut them just as they're about to open. And that way they will last much longer. But if I want any flowers in the house, this is the last fling. I'm going to cut some, take them in. And if they only last 24 hours, well, so be it. And the whole point of having special rows of cut flowers means that you can cut great big bunches and have really good displays indoors and still have your flowers in the borders looking at their best. Whereas if you go out and you cut a whole load of flowers from the border, it leaves a big hole. It means you're robbing Peter to pay Paul. So it's a good idea. Now that's all we've got time for today. And I will be back next week, but not here at Longmiller, because next week it's the Chelsea Flower Show, and I'll be there all week long with the rest of the team. And our first programme is on Sunday night. So I'll see you in just a few days' time. Till then, bye-bye. The great Beth Chateau died earlier this week at the ripe old age of 94. I had met Beth many times, and of course, Carol interviewed her just a year or so ago for this program. Writing, teaching, and incomparable garden. So let's celebrate a life that was supremely well-lived.